Hello and welcome everybody. Um, my name is Liz Barrett and I am the third vice president with Les Dames de Spaffier. Um, and welcome to the Food Writers Survival Guide for an Ever-Changing Landscape. Um, I first want to give a huge shout out to Jackie Pressinger of the American Culinary Federation, who's also a Dom based in Florida. We, this is our very first um, collaboration with the American Culinary Federation. So we have a big mix of both members of Le Dom de Spoffier International and the American Culinary Federation. Um, and we have an amazing slate of speakers today. And I would first like to introduce our moderator, Martha Teichner. Martha is a 13-time Emmy Award winner and a five times, oh, wait, did I? Yeah, and a five-time James Beard Foundation Award winner. She has been with CBS News since 1977, and she can be seen regularly on CBS Sunday Morning, covering, among other topics, food, beverage, and hospitality. Most recently, Martha profiled Chef Mashama Bailey and Jana Morisano, partners at Savannah's iconic restaurant, The Gray, on CBS Sunday Morning. Martha, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce our panelists. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. First, we have Virginia Willis, who is a Food Network kitchen chef and James Beard Foundation award-winning cookbook author who has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, People Magazine, Eater, and Food 52. Virginia has contributed to allrecipes.com, Eating Well, Garden and Gun, Bon Appetit, and many other publications. In addition, Virginia is a food media consultant, helping authors, recipe developers, and others strengthen their media skills. Virginia is based in Georgia. Then we have Chandra Ram, who is a senior digital food editor for Food and Wine magazine and a James Beard Foundation Award and IACP nominated cookbook author. Chandra currently serves as the vice chair of the James Beard Journalism Award Committee. Prior to joining Food and Wine magazine in 2021, Chandra was editor in chief of Plate magazine, read by restaurant and institutional chefs across the country. She is based in Chicago. And we have Jean Marie Brownson, who is a culinary consultant and former culinary director for ConAgra Brands and co owner and culinary director of Frontera Foods. Jean Marie has written multiple cookbooks and has won a James Beard Cookbook Award and has been an award winning food journalist for the Chicago Tribune for decades. Jean Marie currently writes about food for the, the, for the Tribune Content Agency. Jean Marie is also based in Chicago. So the food writing landscape has changed a lot, especially over the last two years with COVID. There are more freelance writers, few staff writers, people's attention spans have shortened, threatening long form writing. Social media has changed everything. There is more content online than there is in print. The popularity of podcasts and video has pushed written content to the side for many people. So what I'd like you to do, each of you in turn, um, talk about how you see that changing landscape and personalize it. I mean, how has it affected you? And um, this has to be about five minutes each. If you could all just sort of have like an opening statement, please. Let's start with Jean Marie, because you're very large in the screen right now. <laughs> Not sure I'm comfortable with that. <laughs> Um, I, I did my uh, chef's apprenticeship with the American Culinary Federation. And when I was doing that, I don't think I set out to be necessarily a food writer. Uh, I thought I wanted to be a chef. I always liked to cook. And uh, somewhere along after my apprenticeship, I was hired by Cuisine Magazine and started to be surrounded by food writers at the top of their game. People like uh, Roy Andes Group. To Groot. And this was a long time ago. This was in the early 80s. And what I saw and what I learned and what I still see today is becoming an expert in whatever your topic is that you're writing about. Um, I don't think people, they have short attention spans, but they don't want you to have short attention spans in your writing. Dig deep, 
get into the subject, master the subject, even if it's a short little thing. Uh, for example, you know how to how to peel a hard boiled egg, and you're just doing a little a little snippet for that. Uh, really understand it, you know. And for me, getting in the kitchen and understanding food always gives me plenty to write about. Um, I've my food writing has changed over the years from. Uh, for the Chicago Tribune, we did everything back in, in the 80s where people needed so much help back then that we even would devote half a page of newsprint, which today seems crazy, to uh, a menus of the week where we told people what to cook on Sunday to have leftovers for Monday. Uh, cooking has changed. Obviously, people aren't cooking that way anymore. Um, they, they're they doing shorts, you know, uh, sort of deep dives into something. They might uh, do make baked bread for a week or for a month and they really, really want to understand it. Or they have 30 minutes to get dinner on the table for four. How do you write to that? Um, how do you address it? So I think staying in touch with, the, with who your audience is, wherever you're writing, know your audience. And that will be a natural way for you to just sort of be the expert in, in that. Um, but it's really important today to take photographs, if you're doing whatever you're doing, even if they're just uh, reference photographs, but you know, I've taken a lot of classes on how to take photography so that I'm really good at it. I did a tremendous amount of food styling so I can couple that with my writing that makes me a more valuable contributor to anything that I'm writing either for the newspapers or for online or for magazines. Uh, they may not use my photographs, they may go in and shoot something on their own, but it also makes me a food writer with more than just writing skills. Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to talk about is recipe writing. I'm a, I'm a home cook at heart uh, and trained as a chef. And one of the things that I do when I wrote um, three books with Rick Bayless, my, what I brought to that party uh, was how to make restaurant cooking a cuisine that was pretty foreign at the time when we started doing it to most of this country, how to make it relevant for home cooks and how to, so that they could relate to it. And by being in the stores, I can't, I'm sort of surprised sometimes by the number of food writers that are out there that are not familiar with what's in the grocery store and what the challenges that their readers might be facing when they shop, uh, first off, and then giving a lot of substitutions for it, but really understanding what those people are facing when they go to the store will help you become a better writer, or certainly become a better recipe writer. Virginia? Wow. So I think that one of the things that, that I think about with the food writing and the, and the changing um, landscape of it is that uh, for people that don't like change, if you don't like change, you sure as hell aren't going to like being relevant, right? So we all have to change and grow. And this is something that I think has been, you know, literally happening uh, for, for, for hundreds of years, for, you know, hundreds of years. Um, and food writing, and to my mind, one of the greatest things that's happened is that it's not simply uh, an, an essay in a, a print uh, medium. It's not just simply an essay um, in a book. Uh, there's food writing and podcasting. There's I do food writing when I'm creating the copy for or a 15 second reel, you know, on Instagram. So I think that one of the things that that has changed the, the most with food writing is um, there are two ways of looking at it. Like, holy moly, we've got so much to do. We're content creators now to, wow, look at all of what we get to do. Um, because it really is uh, telling a story. And to my mind, it doesn't ma matter if it's a 15 second reel or a 15,000 word essay on lion's mane mushrooms. Um, our job is to tell a story. And I, I feel like the, the most important thing is to understand um, your audience. So that is something I always try to consider. Um, what if I'm if I'm doing something that's a 15 second reel on Instagram? I I know that people have got the attention span of a gnat now, uh, and so I short, quick bullet points make it snappy. Um, and then it's really nice to sort of be able to luxuriate in in longer pieces and to be able to, to deep, dive dive deeper in. Um, it always goes back to the assignment. Uh, I'll, I'll mirror what um, Jean Marie says. Uh, I think that having the culinary background, having the recipe writing background, um, I too, uh, I like to consider my work uh, chef inspired recipes for home cooks. And so I like to try to take 
um, some of the things that what restaurant chefs might be doing in a kitchen and to let home cooks know that they're really accessible. Um, it's a daunting time with so many changes in print, but I think at the same time, it's also a very exciting time because there's so many changes happening in the digital landscape. Chandra? Well, gosh, well, first, thank you all so much for having me. Um, and I want to reiterate, uh, you know, I think a lot of what Jean Marie and, and Virginia had to say is, you know, is also on my list of what I would, you know, what I would say about food writing today. Um, one thing I, I do want to say is that um, I thought it was interesting uh, when you were, Martha, when you were is at talking about where we're all from, because when I was in culinary school and knew I wanted to be a food writer, I had previously studied journalism and had this idea that you had to um, get a job with a local paper and try and get in with a food section and then maybe move to a larger paper and be willing to move around and um, follow your career in that way and or live in New York so that you could write for one of the big consumer glossies. And I think that we have absolutely seen that that has changed quite a bit. I mean, case in point, I technically work on a, um, on a team based in New York. Um, and I also spend probably ha half of my time um, working with the team based in Birmingham, Alabama. So it's, um, you know, the fact that you can do it from anywhere, I think, uh, is an important one because that's what this digital world, uh, you know, has allowed us. And you know, for better or worse, that's what COVID has trained us and, and at least explained to us. Um, but, you know, there, there's, like I said, there's a lot of what uh, Jean Marie and Virginia have said that I think is really important. Um, certainly, if you are going down the path of recipe development and want to get your recipes out there and be able to write food driven pieces um, that are anchored on a recipe, having those photography skills that Jean Marie referenced. Um, is so important. And I think it's, you know, whether you're using a really great camera phone or you've got um, another setup, I think understanding lighting, understanding propping and plating is so incredibly important. And then as well, if you're looking to get, you know, get out there and be better known for, uh, for your recipes and trying to, you know, to, in hopes that something can go viral or that, I think, that's where you really have to dive into social media in a huge way. And that's a big part of what we talk about um, with food and wine is, you know, what are people talking about on social media? What trends are coming up on social media? What questions do people ask? Um, we had a conversation this morning about the fact that um, I think it was yesterday, um, Stephen King posted a recipe or an, a, a brief note on um, how to cook salmon, how he cooks salmon and um, how he does it in the microwave. And we were talking about it in food and wine staff meeting this morning because that is something that was popping up all over social media. And we wanted to be able to respond to that because that's that was like one of the questions of the moment. So I think understanding that and understanding how social media is changing, um, that Instagram is really prioritizing reels that, um, you know, if you want to get your content out there, you need to get comfortable with posting quite a bit. Um, but, and, and I think as well, you know, if you're, if you're not looking at that side of things, if you're not looking at, um, uh, at recipe writing or anything, you know, one thing I would throw in there is if you want to start getting into it right now, just get into it. Don't wait for an invitation. Don't wait necessarily even for an assignment. Start writing things and um, start blogging, start writing thoughtful posts on social media. Just start writing because every one of us as writers only improves by writing more. So that's something that's really important. But also like keep an eye out for what people are talking about. Um, a few years ago when I was working on my um, Indian cookbook, uh, I actually was very, was working on um, 
was working on the first draft of the book and was stuck in bed for a couple of days with the flu. And I was kind of in that in-between point where I wasn't feeling up to writing, but I didn't want to just lie there. So I actually went into an Indian cooking group on Facebook and someone had posted the question, hey, are people here Indian or are you just interested in uh, Indian food? And it turned out it was a two to one mix of people who didn't necessarily come from an Indian heritage or a South Asian heritage, but were just incredibly interested in the food. And that was so helpful for me to understand when I was working on this book, what questions people had and where they were coming from. So I think that that's, um, you know, to reiterate what Virginia was saying, like see what, what questions people have about something. I find it very helpful often to have a reader or, you know, just someone I can run things by who is not a food person at all, who's not going to, who hasn't been like obsessed with the same food questions the rest of us have, um, and maybe doesn't know a ton about cooking, but enjoys it and would like to try it. And just ask that person like, hey, what looks interesting to you? What questions do you have? And also what about this recipe or what this article does not make sense? Because I think that that's very, very helpful. At the end of the day, what we're doing is creating, you know, we say like creating content. We're creating, we're writing articles, we're writing essays, we're creating recipes. And part of it, of course, is for us because we want to get what we're thinking, um, get our experience, our art out there in the world. But it's also for someone else to take in if you're looking at the vast majority of food writing. So think about that person. Don't ever, ever forget about the reader. When I looked at uh, the websites each of you have, um, what I noticed is that each one of you has um, a very sophisticated website and it serves not only as a, a doorway to your work, but it also serves as an artist's portfolio in effect, a, a resume and um, a showcase and so on. Um, each one of you had track records and visibility um, before all these huge changes began to really um, transform the landscape. Um, do you, is, is your website, um, like the bridge from um, the establishment, the old kind of establishment that um, catapulted you to visibility and the new and, and how important is all of that as, as uh, would-be food writers take a look at how you function and how you've changed? Anybody jump in? I'll go, it's Virginia. Okay. Okay, uh, so I look at my website as sort of one-stop shopping for, for everybody that could potentially be my, my reader or my customer, because I have to do many different things, because newsflash, as a food writer, you're going to have to do many different things. So uh, I have um, articles that are written about me, as well as articles that I write. Um, there are links to social, there's links to my blog. If I had a medium newsletter or Substack or something like that, then, which I don't, but that's another thing. Um, but I would have a link to that there too. So, and I feel strongly about branding. I mean, I think that that's sort of a weird word for writers. I consider myself a food writer. I do not consider myself a journalist. Um, so I think that there's a, a difference there and that that's something that, that people need to be cognizant of if they're making a decision about what kind of food writing that they wanna do. In your opinion, um, in, your, in your life, is food writing an accessory or part of the, the multi, multiple aspects of your career um, or is it um, the main event? I mean, is it, is it some, do most people who um, function in the food writing world have to be a chef, a cookbook writer, a, a writer, a food writer, writer, um, and a performer. Well, yeah, I think that D, all of the above is almost pretty much necessary now, right? Because everything has become so video driven. So performer is exactly the, a, a great way to put it, Martha. Um, in terms of food writing, I don't really, it's not certainly not an accessory. It's not a, it's not a side hustle. It is a component. 
And I like to think of like the work that I do is all supporting one another. There's a bunch of different ingredients going into this soup pot that creates the career that I'm able to have. Um, so sometimes I need to be able to write like, you know, this is how you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And it's super simple. And I just need super clear instructions for people that have no idea on how to make a peanut butter jelly sandwich. Um, and then other times I'm able to do a reel on, you know, dried persimmons or something that's like really sort of esoteric and something only that it would be um, very chef driven. Uh, at the end of the day, it's all a story, right? And you, you know, you've told stories for decades. So it just, I think our parameters have changed on what storytelling is. Um, but going back to the first part, my website is where people can find where I tell my stories, regardless of what they are. Chandra? Yes. Well, uh, uh, Jean Marie, you got, you started to talk and then jump yeah, in. Yeah, I was going to say, um, unlike Virginia, I'm not comfortable being a performer coming from the newspaper world. I'm mm -hmm. comfortable being um, the person who brings other people's stories to life. And I think that there's a lot of uh, writers out there that aren't necessarily going to be the stars of their food writing, but they can support the people that are. Um, so many chefs okay. and professionals need someone to help them hone their story, craft what they're trying to say. And there's a whole, uh, um, there's a huge career out there for people that want it in, in being that support system writer. Uh, and I, that's, I mean, I've found a lot of pleasure in writing books with chefs. Uh, and helping them tell their stories with their voice and helping them find their voice. It's a very satisfying way for me to write. I also love to write more about other people's things. Uh, that comes from my, my years at the Chicago Tribune, um, telling the stories that uh, of other writers, other experts, people that have really dug into something. Um, you know, I was just reading something the other day about Claudia Rodin and all the travel that she's done in her life. And now she's writing this book um, that she's writing from her cooking from home. Uh, few food writers today can spend the years that she spent uh, researching her the food that she wrote about. Uh, it's it's time consuming. It's very it's not very affordable and very few people are really going to do that give you know 10 years to setting the food of all the regions of mexico or something like that um so if you can go in as a and bring your food writing skills to someone who has a story to tell and you're helping them tell their story there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, opportunity for that kind of food writing as well jean marie um, when i was looking at your um website and so on one of the things that turned up was re a reference to muckrack. Um, and it was described as a free tools to help journalists compile and showcase their portfolios to track the impact of their stories, to, to uh, keep up with news and expand a person's um, footprint online. Um, what role does something like muckrack, muckrack have um, in terms of, of um, maximizing the benefit of social media, of the website, of all the different things that are now components of, of the food career that food writing is part of. Um, I'm, I'm actually not really familiar with Mark Craig, except that I know, uh, I'm not sure that was- It turned up when I looked at your website. I, get, I understand what, what muckrack is. Oh, it's well, like, um, then then um, sorry. everybody else jump in because I, I found it fascinating because of the fact that it, it seems to be um, for people who are just getting started or, or don't know how to pull it all together, that it seemed <laughs> um, like an interesting um, tool. I don't necessarily know that not being able to pull it together and just starting are mutually exclusive. <laughs> um, but I think that Muckrack, um, Muckrack is like a, 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 a consolidation service of sorts that you're able to put your, um, your writer's links, your, your bylines. Um, I, I feel like it's more of what I would consider almost like a journalistic tool. And Chandra, maybe you know more about this, but um, I feel like it's more like a journalistic tool that like uh, pu publishers, publishing companies, media organizations, it's, it's, it, it's a portfolio of sorts. It's a way to have a portfolio of sorts of um, online content. Chandra? 
Yeah, I mean, I actually don't use it um, much at all, but um, that's my understanding of how people use it. I will say, and I've noticed in the in the comments here, you know, there are people saying like, oh, hey, well, I don't want it to be about me. And I think that's great because there can only be so many people, like we need people to who don't yeah, want the spotlight themselves and they want to, to shine it on someone else. And I think those are often so many of like the best stories that we get. I will say, I find it, very, I found it very helpful um, when I was freelancing to be able to, I loved being able to update my website with different types of content because I especially took a lot of time last year and uh, did writing workshops and started to get into writing personal essays, um, which I hadn't really done much of before. And I was really proud to be able to show off that work, but I also knew that maybe someone wasn't on food 52 at that, you know, getting the newsletter that day and, and knowing what was going, you know, seeing my piece or whatever. So it's something that, um, I think having, having a website is fantastic, um, because it just gives a landing page. If you developed a recipe and you want to send people there, if you wrote pieces, um, and you want to send people there, it doesn't have to be something that you're pushing so much, but I, you know, I just like picked a, uh, a template on Squarespace that looked good, um, built it. I, um, I did wind up contracting with someone to help me build it because even though they keep telling you it's really easy, I didn't find it to be that easy, but I think there's very simple like WordPress sites and things that don't need to cost much or any money at all. Um, but I will say anytime I get a writer pitch, um, I go to that person's website. I want to see what else they've done. I want to see, um, you know, they may have, if, if they've written for Epicurious, I can text my friend Maggie at Epicurious and say, Hey, you worked with this person. Did you, and you know, was it a good experience or whatever? I haven't worked with them. Um, I want to be able to see the breadth and depth of their expertise of the type of work they've done, um, anything like that. So I think it's incredibly important to be able to send editors to send potential um, book pub you know book agents, publishers, all of that like have a place to send them so they can get a sense of what your work is. So that raises the question to me of, of um, if someone is not famous or uh, as a cookbook writer or a chef or whatever um, and they don't necessarily have, a day job, if you will, with a newspaper or an actual physical magazine uh, and so on. Um, if they're just sort of writing and throwing it out into space, um, yes, on social media, that maybe they'll establish a presence, but is there is something like Substack, um, a place that it, in a sense um, will give people a place to go to find you if you're trying to establish a foothold? Well, the way I'm seeing most people use, food writers use Substack these days is when they want to uh, kind of create a, a newsletter and send it out to their audience. And quite often, for very good reason, um, these are paid newsletters. And so I can't access any of the archives unless I'm a paying subscriber. So, and you're a paying subscriber to each newsletter as opposed to a paying subscriber to Substack or correct. Right. You, you pay to subscribe to each one. And so it's something that I will be perfectly honest when I, when I see the thing of like, oh, Hey, I've launched this newsletter on Substack. I'm a little bit like, oh, okay. <laughs> so that means I need to pay for another separate, you know, content stream, I'm going to be getting that many more emails and that sort of thing. So I think it's, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, it's a little, um, it, it's becoming overwhelming to me because my inbox is overwhelming and to get three posts a week, which is what Substack recommends, uh, its writers do, um, from each of 20 different people, plus all the media, things plus, you know, an email from my mom that I'd like to get first. Um, it, it gets to be tough. So, 
But, you know, all of that to say is if you can do it, it's fantastic. I mean, I, I don't know any numbers here. It's my understanding that like Alison Roman is, I have read that she, she has the most popular uh, and like has the highest subscription rate for uh, food newsletters on Substack and is generating a lot of revenue from that. But, um, you know, she's putting out content however often she is, uh, but you have to pay to get to a lot of it. So the flip, the flip side of that is if you're someone who, again, is trying to establish a foothold um, or is not known as a chef, if you want to be a food writer, um, can you make a living without also being a cookbook writer, a chef, someone who has um, various other platforms as part of this multi the multiplicity of skills um, that seem to make a career? Can you afford to just be a food writer? Well, I, th I this is Virginia. I mean, I think years ago, it was almost probably eight or 10 years ago, uh, Amanda Hesser of Food 52 um, made this comment that she wouldn't suggest that anyone go into food writing. And it, I remember then it created this tsunami of, you know, seriously emotional, distraught response. Um, it's hard to make a living as a writer. It never, it never has been an easy, easy way to make a living, regardless of what you're writing about. Um, and so while I definitely appreciate and understand the people that want to be more behind the scenes and write for other people, um, you know, both paths are hard. There's no way, there's no other way of looking at it. Um, putting yourself out front and being more of a personality and, uh, and also a food writer and recipe developer and spokesperson and all the things like I do, that's one way of doing it. It's certainly not easy. And then the other way of doing it, being behind the scenes, um, you, you know, that's, in my mind, it's almost even more challenging because you have to find the person to be the behind the scenes for. Um, but have to be it, in addition, does that does this whole new landscape change what is um, what people are doing as food writers? For example, um, I used to read Barry Estabrook's investigative journalist uh, journalism pieces in Gourmet Magazine. Well, right. Gourmet Magazine is gone. Um, uh, it, there are there's the is is MFK, uh, an MFK Fisher impossible today. Um, someone who would be able to make a living writing beautiful literary food articles and books and so on and so forth without that multidimensional platform that's very tact, um, sort of um, tactile and, and chef and food, uh, specifically um, the making of food related um, that you all are part of. I mean, I think that it's, it's, it's tough. There are a thousand different ways to be a food writer and you, and, you know, it very much depends on what you need and what you want to consider yourself successful. But I, th I think where a lot of it comes down to is the fact that when, um, there used to be just a few places where you could read essays and investigative reporting and feature reporting and find recipes. And also there were just a few other places where you got information at all, right? Now, when you publish a piece, it becomes part of a tidal wave of content that hits mm -hmm. seven times a day, every single day. And so it's, it's not, I think the whole question about having a website and having that kind of presence isn't so much like, do I want the attention? I, um, I actually have a certain amount of anxiety about putting myself out there, but I want to get my work out there. And so um, when, you know, when I wrote my cookbook, the cookbook I wrote by myself, um, I realized that I wasn't like depending on a chef or co-author to publicize it. I had to do all of that myself. And it, it kind of felt a little gross to be like, hey, me, me, me. And like, why don't you write about me? But on the other hand, I'd written this book and, and I, had to, I had to promote my work. And so that was, that was the point of it. And 
that made me feel a lot more comfortable about it because it's, um, you know, this idea that people seek out articles and, you know, whatever kind of food content um, has gone by the wayside quite a bit. More, more people are looking for it to follow them around, whether it's on social media, whether it's via newsletters, um, it needs to it needs to come to them because we have 9,000 other things that we have to deal with every day that maybe we didn't have. Before. But how do you, it seems to me that the need for, with the deluge of content that that is thrown at people in the field and also layman readers, um, how else other than the website, the blog, the, the podcast, um, the social media, do you in any way, shape or form have enough visibility to break through so that you can make a living? Well, I think that's the, the, the everything that you just mentioned. I mean, this is the, uh, the, the, the problem, right? Blogs, I don't get, unless I, unless someone has advertising, they don't get money they don't get money from their blog unless it's a sponsored blog post. There's no money from the blog. There's no, you know, unless you have a relationship with a, with a company, there isn't um, sponsored social media post. or um, as Chandra mentioned earlier, Instagram is really pushing um, reels. Uh, some content creators have relationships with Instagram and are being compensated to produce reels. So uh, all of that we just discussed digitally doesn't actually like pay the mortgage or pay the car note. Right, so um, it is unfortunate, and I saw one of the comments earlier that uh, was said like, "Well, I'm being paid so much less uh, for writing for online content than I used to be for print." Um, yes, I mean I don't even know what to say about that. That is true. I mean people used to get you know six figure magazine, I mean six figure uh, cookbook deals. Um, it was always a unicorn, and it's like now it's like a unicorn with fairy dust, right? So it's just that much harder. But unfortunately, it's it's part of the process, and I would liken it to being in the kitchen, and it's no different from doing your apprenticeship, or working for free, or doing a stage in Europe, or whatever. You you have to do the work to develop the reputation to be able to be honored with the opportunity to do the work and to get paid for it. What um, comes so first in that well, you, doing the work? I, I think that you, you have to start, in my mind, you have to start creating the content. And I saw Tony Allegro was uh, in the in the questions and, you know, Tony used to have the Greenbriars, uh, the Food Writers Conference at the Greenbrier. And the same questions were asked when I was at a conference, you know, 15, 10, 15, 20 years ago. You know, what do I write about and how do I get started? Uh, what do you write about? You write about what you know, you write about what you love, you write about what you're passionate about, you write about what you care about. Um, because that's the only thing that, that really uh, matters uh, on some level. And, and what we hope happens is that that, that passion, that, that spark, that inspiration, that joy, that beauty of a gorgeous sentence, that's what goes out into the piece. And that piece could be that 15 second Instagram reel, or it could be a 15,000 word piece, but that's, that's where it is. Like hoping that people find that joy and can share that uh, knowledge and experience. It's sort uh, of uh, like uh, Jean Marie. We have yeah. I was just trying exactly. to get you to say something because you haven't lately. I, I was thinking it's it's the ten thousand hours. You know, it's it's the the Beatles playing music for ten thousand hours before they uh -huh. they really broke through. People forget that the people who rise to the top of their profession spend tons and tons and tons of time uh, in in that rise. And I think as a food writer, you have to spend tons and tons of time writing. And it might mean that you make $75 for a piece online, uh, and then you rewrite that piece for someone else, and maybe you make another $50. And it's those are small dollar amounts, which really haven't changed since I started the food writing. I, I, I make the same amount of money that I made 20 years ago for, for something for the, for the Tribune newspapers, for example. Um, but it's the it's putting in the time to be the expert. And it's sort of that, um, I think it was Virginia that said earlier, you just have to write. And the, be the more you write, the better writer you become. Um, and you find, uh, you find people that edit you or, you know, um, look at your piece and give you really good feedback. 
And then you just keep resubmitting it. You keep and you keep writing. And, and you put your 10,000 hours into that. And if you're writing about cooking, then you have to also put 10,000 hours into cooking. And what about you networking cook, and con uh, the contacts you have? I mean, is it to break through? Uh, does it require serious networking? Does it require knowing people? Um, or can you just somehow start from nothing? Well, networking can be everything from in person with, with folks going out if you decide you're gonna write about, about pasta, um, going and, and taking classes with pasta experts and then buying their books and then traveling to eat it um, to some of the networking can be what your, your research, on your online research, your, your, your uh, research into what's already been written. And I, I believe in a huge believer in giving credit to something like that if you're gonna you're going to write a, a recipe that's for lasagna. Talk about where did that come from? Makes you more of an expert than saying you just created this out of your head because you didn't. Um, so the networking it is to me critical. I need to eat with other food writers and food people because I learn something every time. I need to read everything that I can. Um, my my inbox is crammed and I'm trying to always get to everything that I can read because in a day's reading there, I always learn something. And that's that's a, a way of networking as well. All of you, what makes good food writing? What makes a story compelling? What I would say is it's like, it's transportive, right? So if I, um, what I find when I'm reading good food writing, whether it's um, something on Substack or a blog post or whatever, what I consider, and I'm not, I don't even, I can't claim that all of my writing is like this because it's not, but what I find to be beautiful in food writing is when I am, when I can feel it, when I can taste it, when I can touch it, and I can't, it's just in those words. Um, so it's really, it, it just goes back to that, you know, Joseph Campbell business of telling a story and what's the hero doing. And, and uh, you know, it just so happens on this, in this instance that the hero is eating something or she. Yeah, I, I think it's, I think, you know, when a piece of writing is, is beautiful and it resonates because that person cares, it's, you know, it, a great piece of food writing has soul to it. And it, um, it's not something nine times out of 10 or 99,000 times out of a hundred. Like it's, it's, it's something that, um, that shows that you cared, that you put in the research for it, that you took your time with your, your word selection, with your sentence construction, and all that, but in the end, the piece has a little bit of soul. It, it's more than just, um, hey, here's this, here's like an utterly neutral news announcement or whatever. It's something that shows that the writer cares and that this matters. What, what interests me also is, is um, the definition of food writing in a sense to me in some ways is broader at the same time it's narrower in the uh, new landscape. I, I, I have in the back of my head, there was a series, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, the Post and Courier newspaper uh, in a food town has multiple food writers. They have a food critic, but they also have people who write about food in lots of different ways. And, and um, uh, the former food critic um, or lead food writer at the Post and Courier, um, wrote um, a series of articles about restaurants that um, uh, it, it analyzed whether or not the restaurants in Charleston were accessible to disabled people. It wasn't particularly um, reviewing the restaurants for the food, it was reviewing the restaurants for accessibility. And that in a, is a form of food writing. Um, is there a broader range of stuff people can write about and get published, or is it narrowed by the fact that that MFK Fisher kind of writing is, in a sense, the domain of people who have enough visibility so that you go there to find it? 
Well, I think that, uh, I think Kim Severson has sort of an expression, you know, it, it always goes back to food. It's always about the food. It doesn't matter if we're talking about history, uh, geography, politics, philosophy, religion, you know, um, I have a very strong belief that everything that we believe is reflected in what's on the end of our fork. And I think that food is a commonality and that's why food writing is such an exciting topic. That's why this, we're having this conversation today. It's why that why there's 350 people on this call right now um because everyone has to eat um and it, it's not just like the, the the chef piece of it so we're not talking about something esoteric we're talking about something like that's nutrition that we need to sustain ourselves but at the same time um food is it's as we all know it's just something that touches every aspect of our life there's always a food angle. That's what I think that what Kim 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 said. There's always a food angle. So, it's a, it may be about uh, uh, disabil disabilities and access to restaurants, but it, it's always it goes back to the food. Yeah, it can I, be I, about I, disability. It can be about nutrition. It can be about access to healthy food. It can yeah. be about what's happening with food supply. It can be about allergies. It can be about all of these things. I mean, we're also talking this morning about the fact that like all the Starbucks stores that are unionizing and the unionizing movement that's happening in America right now with Starbucks, with Amazon, um, other places. And okay, so that didn't just come out of the blue. What has happened to work life in the last couple of years on top of what it was like before that have all led up to those things. And so Virginia is absolutely right. I mean, we interact with food and drink ideally multiple times a day and we make these choices and there is, this is, it's always about food. And so you can say, yes, like I want to write about agriculture. I can, I want to write about workers' rights in the food world. I want to write about um, disability access. I want to write about flavors. I want to write about um, wine, but also like how, you know, how to, how to make it work um, in the wine world. There's all sorts of different things that you can cover. I mean, there's, it's almost limitless. I'm, I'm going to uh, ask Liz whether she can um, identify a couple of questions uh, because we're going to be running out of time before we can get to too many. Um, uh, yeah. We have um, we have questions in the chat and we have questions in the Q and A. So many questions. Say what? We have so many questions. It's we great. Have so many questions. There's like a crazy amount of conversation going on in the chat. Um, you know, I don't know if anybody has a perspective on um, how to reconcile the fact that um, writing for digital content, like website website outlets versus print, pays so much less. And I think I think there's people on this who are curious about the um, your perspective on that about the the different. I can speak. I can speak. I can speak to that. And um, I I just would say that um, I'm not. I write for both print magazines that also go online, and I write for online publications that are only online. Um, you know, none of it pays great, but I don't, I don't know that I see some huge difference with editorial, editorial print or editorial digital, because it's kind of all the same thing because any of the media companies are, are doing the digital, and, you know, two magazines within the past month, um, Eating Well and Martha Stewart are no longer going to be printed publications. They're not going away. They're just going to be digital. So um, I don't, I don't know that, uh, I don't, I don't know that I can speak to the difference because I think that their editorial is both fairly low. The, 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 the difference that occurs is when, you know, whether it's um, editorial or advertorial or sponsored and that, that becomes a different thing. But edit, editorial rates for um, recipe writing and, and, um, and food writing are low. They just are. We're not basketball players. <laughs> Chandra, Jean Marie, anything to weigh in on that? But, and like I said before, it hasn't changed. The rates really haven't changed. And so it's all about if you want to make a living out of it, you've got to be really prolific. And I think 
uh, your chance of getting into print is it, you might submit an article to a magazine that might be a year or two and you have to stay ahead of it. You have to work with those editors to know what they're looking for, when they're looking for it. And it might be months and months in advance. But if you're writing for somebody, you know, for um, Epicurious or something, a, a website, it's much more immediate. And, and then hopefully then the paycheck is as well. So, uh, yeah, good. I think another um, interesting question we see is with the, the proliferation of Instagram and TikTok and all the different social media outlets, is the cookbook dead? No. No, <laughs> it isn't. Yep. I remember no. when Kindles came out and people said, oh, eBooks like cookbooks are now dead and um, cookbooks were the, you know, far and away the strongest print category after that, because we want to sit and look through, flip through books and see photos and experience, experience them that way. I don't know. I feel like, I feel like Virginia needs to like, this is her thing. Cookbooks aren't we're, dead. Cookbook, no, cookbooks there was more. There was more than 450 entries in the IACP cookbook panel judging. I'm sure James Beard had, had, had at least that many. So those are people who felt their, their book should win an award and they submitted it. That means there's many, many more books than that out there. And I can tell you, I'm a cookbook fanatic. I probably want to own, out of those 450, I'd like to own about 300 of them. <laughs> because there's something in every one that I, in every one of them that I can learn, or there's a, there's a voice that I'm interested in, or a story they're telling, or a recipe that I want. And, and I'm not alone. And I'm no longer discouraged if someone says, oh, you know, the average was that if everybody makes three recipes out of a cookbook, that that's a high number of recipes for them to cook. That's okay with me, because if their cookbook followers, they probably have read it, they're learning something there uh, from there. Um, I don't expect anybody to make 50 recipes out of my, one of my books. Um, you know, although I've made 50 of Virginia's recipes, I'm sure. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're such a good recipe writer. Thank you so much, Jean Marie. That's awesome. Um, we have another question about that says, Jean Marie mentioned being a support person to others that might want to be in the spotlight. How does one connect with people like that or get into that line of work? Well, if you're a frequent diner at your favorite neighborhood bistro and you love what that chef is doing, uh, for example, and you get to know them, uh, you can say, well, here, I, I've got this idea for you and I'm willing to help you craft it into something. And then the big job for that would be discipline. Um, I used to tell Rick Bayless that he owed me three recipes a week for the rest of his life and he'd be able to put out a book. Uh, you know, on a fairly regular basis. And, and, and that's how we got that discipline. It's sort of the thing we were saying before, you got to write, write, write. If you're going to write recipes, you got to keep writing recipes. But find uh, what Virginia and Chandra were saying earlier, find the passion that you feel like you want to spend a year, or maybe two years of your life working. If you want to pull it into a cookbook or you want to start with just an article for some online publication, um, really being interested, really wi willing to commit your life to that story, telling that story for, for someone else and with someone else. I see a question here. Do cookbooks make money for writers these days? I got the impression that that may be less so than before. I'll, I'll speak to that. There was something really interesting because IACP is happening at the same time um, in the next couple of days and uh, International Association of Culinary Professionals. And um, uh, I, I, um, someone posted this morning something about writing about cookbooks. Um, I think the thing about writing cookbooks is that uh, people are, uh, people getting into the industry, myself included, once upon a time, are unaware about how it works. So people are paid in advance and advances can be anything from like $5,000 from a small university press um, to, you know, to the unicorns with glitter and stuff, which is like $250,000. The $250,000 are very small. $100,000 is very small. And then you also have to think about the fact that $100,000 essentially covers a two-year project. Um, and often because of the way that the payouts occur, um, let's just pretend it's $100,000. You might be 
paid $25,000 upon signing, $25,000 upon uh, submitting a manuscript. Uh, Random House is $25,000 um, upon publication, and then, uh, then $25,000 upon uh, six months after publication. So it may be $100,000, but it's $100,000 at best um, broken out over two years. And $100,000 uh, is a lot of money in the Copic world, right? It doesn't happen for many people. Um, most advances are $20,000, $40,000 or below. Um, so cookbooks are not a way uh, to make a living. It's just the reality of it. What I feel that cookbook publishing, whether that's in front of the, in front, like myself, or behind the scenes, like someone like Jean Marie, um, that's a consulting project, I would imagine for her. But uh, cookbooks are a way to be able to do other things. So if you have a cookbook, then you are an authority and you are able to get writing assignments. I might be able to write for Chandra because I have a writing, I I've, have a cookbook on you know skinny baking or healthy baking now or something like that. So she might reach out to me with, with her publication that, that I could write. So the thing that a cookbook allows is it allows you the authenticity and the authority. And I feel like that that is where um, cookbooks allow the, your one's career to grow and to have that presence. I'm interested in asking Chandra a question about uh, that sort of growing out of that. Um, mm -hmm. You see things come through the transom, if you will. You you uh, have talked about being deluged and so on. Um, who is getting published, uh, and who are the cook? Uh, who are the food writers that are getting published from where you're sitting? And um, how old are they? And uh, uh, just give us a sense of, of, of who makes it. You know, I, I will say for all of the discussion that we've had about getting your name out there, and I, you know, 100% agree with what Virginia was saying about cookbooks, like it winds up being like a business card you can't fit into your wallet. Um, but um, you don't have to necessarily be a big name chef to get a writing assignment for sure. And I think that uh, Food and Wine is among many publications now who are actively seeking out new voices. And we wanna make sure that in particular, that it's, we're working with people who have expertise. We do wanna see that you've, that you've written before. Um, if I'm planning on featuring your story and it doesn't come in, then that means I still have to publish something that day, but I need to pull it out from somewhere else. I need, I need to, and oftentimes write something myself to make up for it. So I wanna make sure that you're reliable. I wanna make sure that, you, um, that I can trust you, um, that you, uh, you know, you're not cribbing from other sites and things like that. Um, but as long as I can read, some examples of what you've done. Um, it doesn't have, you don't have to have a big name out there for sure. And I will say that um, I'm particularly because also um, from my perspective of being um, a third generation kid, I have an Irish mother and my father was Indian and I grew up in Kentucky. Um, I'm always interested in people who are coming, they might be coming very much out of the woodwork with a different perspective of, um, hey, I grew up uh, you know, mixed race or my family has this culture that hasn't gotten out there that much, but I would love to be able to tell my story. If you can tell your story well, then I wanna hear it. I'm afraid um, I'm gonna have to, and these stories because our time is up and um, I'm going to turn it back over to um, the, uh, the, uh, to either Jackie or, or um, uh, whomever. Um, that, that's me. <laughs> I was... it, so you're going to say goodbye. I know. Yes. We have, we have had an amazing hour and I'm so sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. I want to say, um, Martha, thank you for taking the time and Chandra, Virginia and Jean Marie, just amazing insights and ideas, I think inspiration. 
This um, was recorded. So everybody who registered will get an email tomorrow from the American Culinary Federation with the link to the video that um, it will be open to all if you wanna share it with anybody. And we will be sure and put each of our um, speakers' websites in there. I saw a note in the chat that everybody was interested. So we'll be sure to put that in the email. And Jackie, I'll email those to you. Um, so thank you for joining us and thank you, American Culinary Federation. This was an amazing collaboration, I think. Thank you. Thank y'all. Thanks for having us.